They were a team that could solve any case. This dog is just like a machine. An incredible true story of how man's best friend became investigator's biggest enemy. I just... The dog takes off and boom, suddenly they've got evidence in their hands. A world-renowned canine team. <laughs> Police say a cadaver dog actually led them to the home's basement. They were legendary crime solvers. But then, a sterling reputation begins to tarnish as the investigators become the accused. And I'm looking at the other police officers with me, thinking, did you just see what I seen? You go through this, wow, if this is true, this is extremely problematic. Anderson is this really famous um, dog handler who has this wonder dog that can solve any case. Right there. It's in here, obviously. Yeah, this is all blood. She was able to go into these cases that were just thought to be unsolvable. <laughs> she would, nine times out of ten, find evidence at a crime scene. You had this sort of the wow factor. You know, look at this, wow, this dog is just like a machine. Bam, bam, bam. It's just almost uh, paranormal. On the case is one of the world's best when it comes to finding bodies. This time, they'll have help from one of the best search teams in the country. She spanned the globe everywhere from Pennsylvania on 9-11 to Bosnia to Panama to Wisconsin. If you needed someone to close your case, Sandra was the person to turn to, and Eagle was the dog. Sandra Anderson and her cadaver dog, Eagle, seemed to be the stuff of legend. In 1994, Anderson, a dog handler in Michigan, rescued the Doberman mix from the pound and started training him to detect human remains. Within five years, Anderson's recruit had become an apparent prodigy. The pair made headlines in the missing person case of Sam Conja. Mr. Conja was a businessman local to the Detroit community, had disappeared, his vehicle has been recovered. His remains had never been discovered. She did find some bones and some fragments. Incredibly, Eagle discovered nine tiny bone shards in a creek bed under two feet of mud. For a family seeking closure, here was some solace. Five months later, Anderson and Eagle were called in on another high-profile case. A man named Azizul Islam was suspected of killing his wife. Friends and neighbors have left flowers of condolence at the Islam home, stunned by the unthinkable violence police say may have happened here. The Azizul Islam case, this was a horrific case. My wife comes home over Christmas one year to finalize the divorce and disappears. Human limbs were found in a dumpster behind a Dearborn restaurant. A torso was discovered in a field near Toledo, but police haven't yet found any head. Police needed proof of Islam's guilt, and Anderson delivered. Police say a cadaver dog actually led them to the home's basement. There they found the concrete floor had been freshly painted. And right away, you know, Eagle starts indicating to Sandra. The dog alerted on a freshly painted area of the basement floor, as well as a mop and a bucket. And when they do the testing, they find that, in fact, there is blood underneath that fresh paint. The dog also alerted on a washer and dryer, and there was a saw blade with dried blood on it. Police believed they'd found the tool used to dismember the victim. It looked like Anderson and her wonder dog had solved yet another case. Within weeks, they were on to an even bigger challenge. We knew the woman's body had been dismembered and dumped in plastic bags into the Wisconsin River two months ago. Now, we learn this. All of the skin has been meticulously removed from the victim's face, head, and neck. The defleshing has left the victim faceless, thus making visual identification impossible. 
they're trying to figure out who this woman might might be. They do a facial reconstruction. They eventually get a tip that this is the cousin of Peter Capaza. Seven years ago, the emotionless school teacher came to Madison from Eastern Africa to marry and find a better life. Now he stands charged with one of the most brutal crimes in recent Wisconsin history. The police need to prove that he killed her somewhere on his property. Anderson and Eagle went to work. And according to Sandra, Eagle is indicating that there's blood all over Peter Capaz's apartment. The scene appeared clean. But according to Anderson, the dog sensed traces of blood on Kupaz's doorknobs, in his bathroom, and on knives and a cutting board in his kitchen. Peter Kupaza was charged with murder. With the case supported by the testimony of a dog, Eagle needed to prove his credibility. First of all, the using is going to be beef blood. And so they do this demonstration in court to show that Eagle can, in fact, tell human blood apart from other blood. The prosecution bloodied three cloths, two with animal blood, one with human blood. And they have Eagle choose the handkerchief on it with human blood. Eagle passed the test, becoming the first dog in U.S. history who might be called an expert witness in a case. His testimony helped seal the defendant's fate. We, the jury, find the defendant, Peter T. Kupaza, guilty of first-degree intentional homicide. That's your circle, gentlemen. I'm going to reward the dog. Winter 2000. The dream team took on a new challenge, archaeology. And at the end of the day, Eagle has found a new resting place for the remains of French settlers who died more than 200 years ago. In southern Michigan, at a newly cleared construction site, bones began to turn up. Eagle helped to redesignate the grounds as an historic site by finding the graves of dozens of settlers. Archaeology magazine declared Eagle the only dog in the world certified for ancient human remains detection. The article caught the attention of the Panamanian Truth Commission, a group dedicated to uncovering Manuel Noriega's alleged atrocities. For a reported $100,000, they invited Anderson to join in their effort. She and Eagle did not disappoint. It's blood. Look at this is blood. You just get a bash. Mm. There's blood. There's blood. Uh -huh. There it is again. Wow. Mm -hmm. Five hits. Well, this was, I mean, oh. Sandy created a storm of publicity. Every day, pretty much, we were there. Um, there was an article in the paper what Eagle had done. And there was even talk about the Panamanian government producing a postage stamp with Eagle's image on it. She starts finding bone fragments, you know, all over the countryside. Touch? Yeah, okay. Well, the dog starts barking or alerting that there is something in the wall. And the law enforcement people are saying, well, what could we possibly find? Sandra pushes and they tear down the wall. Behind the wall, a shocking discovery, human teeth. Anderson and her dog were now international heroes, showered with acclaim. There was talk of launching a foundation named after Eagle, even a feature film. It seemed dog and handler could do no wrong, but then they hit a snag. The DNA results came in on the bloody saw from the Azizul Islam murder case, and they weren't what anyone expected. The blood on the floor was the victim's blood. The blood on the saw blade was not the victim's. So it was one of those great big red herring question marks of whose blood is on this saw blade. The prosecution went to trial without the saw blade Eagle had found and still scored a life sentence. But questions remain. Had Islam killed a second victim? Or was Eagle's key discovery not what it appeared? Sandra Anderson and her cadaver dog, Eagle, demonstrate an astounding ability to find even the faintest traces of blood and human remains. But in the crime lab, the puzzle pieces don't always fit together. 
In the Azizul Islam case, the saw Eagle found is shown to bear the blood of someone other than the victim. In the case where he found bone shards in a creek bed, when the DNA results come in, investigators get another surprise. It was discovered that uh, this was not, in fact, uh, uh, a match to the bones of Mr. Kanja. And now we have a second quandary to find out where that bone came from and who else may be missing. Investigators believe that Eagle is so good, he's found the remains of a victim they aren't even looking for. Anderson and Eagle continue to be in high demand. Their next case takes them in search of Stephen Clark, who's been missing for three years. Police believe they know where he's buried. She goes onto the grounds of this industrial area, um, the business property of Strasscon with Eagle. Amid 33 acres of rubble, Eagle homes in and finds three bone fragments. But once again, DNA testing shows that the bones aren't from the victim. In fact, they're from two different people. On their next case, the mystery only deepens. The body of Elizabeth Coots has been missing for a year when the family calls in Eagle and Anderson. And hopefully, with a little help, I think, from above, we can give some closure to this wonderful family. Sure enough, Eagle scores a grim find, a finger bone. But as it turns out, it belonged to a man. Once again, Eagle's discovery seems to make no sense. That same month... No bullet, no gun, no shell casing either, and no witness description. It's been a weekend of many questions and few answers for the Lansing police. Bernita White's body had been left in plain sight. But the bullet that killed her is nowhere to be found. The two dogs had completed their search. All the lab personnel were on their hands and knees searching. And then lab personnel went over that entire area again with metal detectors. And they didn't find anything. So then they decided to contact Sandy Anderson. In less than five minutes, Eagle does it again. A spent round, but there's no blood on it. This extra layer of mystery to a mystery that already exists. They're already trying to solve a crime, and on top of that, now they have this, you know, other stuff that just does not fit into the case. Gotcha. That same summer, Eagle seems to outdo himself. Eagle, show me. With a case as cold as they come. 20-year-old Sharita Thomas had been missing for 21 years. In 1980, it was initially a missing person's complaint filed by Sharita Thomas' fiancé. Her vehicle was found on the side of the road. Witnesses show that a gentleman in a blue truck pulled up to give her some assistance in getting her car going. She got in the truck and has not been seen since. Police pursued lead after lead, all of them false. Finally, after years of wild goose chases, Sergeant Alan McGregor went back to square one. We go back in the old files and we realize that probably the initial suspect back then was Jimmy Nelson. Nelson had a blue truck and he also matched the physical characteristics given by the witnesses and uh, he did live within a quarter of a mile from where Sherita Thomas's vehicle was recovered. He had hunting property approximately one mile from where Sharita Thomas's car was found. It was a very large area. We had narrowed it down to approximately two football fields. Well, if you ever heard the, the, the saying, like a needle in a haystack, I think this was tenfold that. It was 21 years since Sharita Thomas uh, was last seen. So we knew we were up against some pretty stiff odds going out there. But the FBI gives McGregor fresh hope courtesy of a famous dog and handler who had earned the Bureau's trust. The FBI had used Sandra Anderson previously to this, and they said that she was the best in the business. From June 2001 through April 2002, Anderson visits the Huron National Forest five times and turns up an apparent windfall of evidence. Every time Sandra Anderson come up here, she'd find bones, human bones. She would find uh, jewelry. She would find pieces of clothing. 
like the whole case was coming together. It was a lot of jubilation. The culmination of 20 years of hard police work is coming to fruition. It was just a matter of uh, matching the DNA up and making the arrest, and we, were, we had this, this case done. Slam dunk. But months later, investigators are in for a huge disappointment. The results come back as these bones do not belong to Sherita Thomas. In fact, the bones came back as different DNA from each other. Unaware of Anderson's previous troubles, investigators give her the benefit of the doubt and start searching for a logical explanation. We looked in the archives and found out that there were three other missing people up in that exact area. Two young girls from 1969 and a young man from the early 1970s. We found a necklace that had some type of hair on it, and that hair turned out to be mink hair. One of the girls was wearing a mink coat. So now all of our cases over, over all the years are coming to this one spot here in the Huron National Forest, and Sandy's finding evidence for all of them. Basically, you know, we're thinking here we've got a, a, a serial killer body dumping ground or something in the middle of the Huron National Forest. Bam. Uh, you'll Good boy. Good okay. Boy. Chop, chop. The cops are not talking to each other in a lot of the cases. Um, you know, they're sort of dealing with their own mess, you know, that, that's, that they've been left with. But that's about to change with a case in Proud Lake, Michigan, that started with a robbery confession. And the criminal informant led the uh, deputy out to this area, and this is where him and the other main suspect had placed the cash registers. Then, the informant reveals a bigger secret about another suspect, Robert Pickering. The criminal informant then uh, elaborated that his uh, partner in crime had confessed to him about killing a person and burying the bones. But he doesn't know where. I got a big one there, huh? So we contacted Sandy Anderson. And on the first search, uh, she found human bones. First search. Any investigator will tell you, especially in a cold case, when someone is able to provide you with a new lead, it's uh, very uplifting. It's a, it's a good feeling because it doesn't happen often. Over two searches, Eagle discovers more than 20 bones. I think we found something. When Anderson is too busy for a third search, the state police canine unit is called in. Rick Hitu and his partner combed the same grounds as Eagle had and didn't find a clue. It was a sore spot. You go out and you work and you work and you work for hours, come up with nothing, and uh, Miss Anderson would go out in the woods or a place that I know was searched several times and find an item within a matter of minutes. In fact, Hitu had just come off of the Bernita White case when Anderson found that spent round. For her to come in in that amount of time and find something that a short time, I just didn't buy it. And that's why we finally decided when Sergeant Nutt was working a case that we would give him the heads up. You know, I understood what they were telling me. They were saying, hey, we don't think that, you know, she's on the up and up and to watch Sandy on the next search. Weeks later, Anderson would return to Proud Lake. And this time, Nutt was not going to let her out of his sight. And this time, Nutt was not going to let her out of his sight. Law enforcement around the country considered Sandra Anderson and her dog Eagle to be crime-fighting heroes. But investigators in Michigan started taking a closer look. They had had suspicions of her ability to locate things subsequent to their very thorough searches uh, for some time. Miss Anderson was clearly of the opinion that there was professional jealousy there. One of the first times I met Sandra Anderson, she brought up the point that her dog has this high success rate, much higher than the state police, and therefore the state police dog handlers don't like her. Challenging Anderson is going to be an uphill battle for state trooper Matt Nutt. On Anderson's third search at Proud Lake, 
It's his turn for a discovery. Her dog had indicated in this area possible uh, human rem remains. I was right here to her uh, right. And she brushes her leg. That's when I seen bone fall out of her pant leg. And I'm standing there going, I can't believe I just seen this. I just seen Sandy Anderson plant a bone. But no one can back him up. There's at least four or five other police officers and everybody's watching her left finger. She just basically distracted the others, you know, almost like a magician would do. And I'm looking at the other police officers with me, my other colleagues, thinking, did you just see what I seen? But no one did. The others in Nuts Task Force, federal agents, state and local police, all dismiss his claim. When we had our debriefing, I kept shaking my head saying, you were right next to me. The reason they doubted me is because Sander Anderson's huge reputation, and they knew that these were major allegations, and it would be a major undertaking to investigate it. Nut launches a one-man mission. I was on the phone talking to other investigators, going to their police departments, sitting down, discussing cases with them that Sandy had worked on, um, looking at their evidence that she had submitted. You know, what did you use Sandy for? Did you notice anything unusual? Other investigators are incredulous. You go through this, wow, if this is true, this is extremely problematic, but but how could this be going on when we've heard such good things uh, about Eagle and, and Miss Anderson all this time? Anyone who is going to say this woman is planting evidence is going to be risking their own reputation because if they're wrong, it's very serious. And, and they know that, and they are sticking their necks out on the line to do this. There are cases all over the country that will be affected by this. They trusted her, and they had a lot invested in her as far as when she submitted evidence in their cases. So they had a lot to lose. A police officer out in Wisconsin made me aware that if I would have contacted a few departments out there, that they would be contacting Sandy Anderson and saying, hey, watch out, because the state trooper in Michigan is investigating you. The deeper Matt Nutt dug, the more heat he took. It's, it's almost as if the other law enforcement officers on that team um, were taking Sandy Anderson's side. Most of them kind of gave me a cold shoulder, and it was very stressful going into that office every day. It was personal. One of the detectives' question to me was, well, have you thought about a polygraph? And I said, well, yeah, no problem. And he goes, no, 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 no. I'm not talking about for Sandy. I'm talking about for you. The attitude was a shock to me. It was horrible. He looked at my report and he went, Pfft. oh, this is that bone caper deal. But Nut refuses to give up. Over three and a half nerve-wracking months, he puts together a case history on Anderson. This file in my hand, it is, uh, with no question, the most important investigation that I've worked on in my 13 years in law enforcement. It really lays out a pattern of Sandra Anderson's um, activity. The bullet she found in the Bernita White case was not a match. They don't find any blood, they don't find any tissue, and there's no markings on the round. The round did not go through Bernita White. It wasn't used to kill her. The Robert Pickering case turns out to be bogus altogether. The suspect passed a polygraph. We dropped our homicide charges against him. Kanja, Stresscon, Coots. In case after case, investigators are left with bones by the dozens, but none of them relevant to the case. I didn't come across one case and where the evidence was found to be that of a victim or found to be of value in investigation. The story gets even stranger in Panama. None of the bones were good matches with 
the person that should have been in a location. These are fragments of Caucasians. They're not fragments of Hispanics. Bone fragments that belong to one person that were scattered hundreds of miles apart across the country. In Nebraska and Wisconsin, archaeologists start to question whether Anderson actually discovered historic remains. One probe reveals that sites she marked as ancient burial grounds are only inches deep before the soil hits bedrock. Nutt's investigation is finally paying off. I talked to our lab director and she took the step of notifying all our state police labs that Sandy was under investigation. An alert goes out to forensic scientists throughout Michigan, but at least one is skeptical. I read the email, I thought to myself, they probably just don't understand this canine handler's methodology. And after I read it, I deleted it. It, it didn't phase me, I just thought people don't understand her, her process. In April 2002, Patchen is invited to join in a now desperate effort to find the remains of Sharita Thomas. We would be working with a canine and a handler and lo and behold, it ended up being Sandy Anderson and her dog, Eagle. Hopes are riding higher than ever on Anderson and Eagle. But little does Anderson know how high the stakes are for her as well. Spring of 2002. Unaware she's being investigated, Sandra Anderson is summoned for a search in Ohio. An automobile crash, no driver with the vehicle. They put divers into the water. Couldn't find the body. So the family of the victim contacted Sandra Anderson, came down, walked around the water a little bit, pointed to an area and said, my dog is telling me that there's a piece of the body right down there. And she produces a toe. A toe, a human toe. With the skin, toenail, everything intact. And they take the toe and they think, OK, well, now we have something to start with. Two weeks later, a surprise. The body surfaced, had its shoes on. The body is then taken to the coroner's office and examined. And it has all its toes. OK, we have 11 toes now. You know, I mean, they, what is going on here? We don't have any other accidents in that area. We don't have anybody that was any rescue calls where somebody may have been mowing grass and, and got their foot underneath a lawnmower. We don't have any of that, right? But we've got a human toe that we don't have any idea where it came from. A week later, Anderson and Eagle are back in Michigan, working the case of missing 20-year-old Sharita Thomas. I was actually down on my hands and knees, and there were no bones there to be found. And A week later, Anderson and Eagle are back in Michigan, working the case of missing 20-year-old Sharita Thomas. I was actually down on my hands and knees, and there were no bones there to be found. And all of a sudden, when Sandra bends down to tie her shoe, now there's a bone there. Anderson calls Jennifer Patchen over to another site the team had already searched. She didn't know how, how good how we'd well actually, we had yeah. done that and how confident I was in myself and you that we went through that and right, we didn't, that we didn't miss, miss anything. Because we, had, well, this was that area that we basically took it right back down yeah. to the bare ground. And I looked down at the pile that we'd already sifted through. She said right there that there was probably uh, what I described as two quarter sized pieces of material like carpet fiber and I thought I didn't miss that there's no way I would have missed that evidence is appearing where before there was none suspicions are mounting but nobody's sure enough to officially point the finger I was awake most of the night that night I'm thinking something's not right here how am I going to confront a woman that's known worldwide for recovering uh, bones and cadavers and stuff the next morning David and Patchen resolved to keep a close eye on Anderson. Right, Shortly after lunch, we were checking an area where Eagle had, what Sanders said, alerted several times that morning. And all of a sudden, like somebody flipped the switch. 
I hear some shouting. I look over. She said, oh, look, you found a bow. And I said, because I just saw you put it there. Yes, I did. I saw it. Jennifer Patchen caught Sandy Anderson red-handed planting a bone. It was actually almost a wrestling match between the two for the bone. I felt like she was starting to raise up on me. I need some help over here. Your mind's in a, in a whirlwind. Wait, wait. One crime scene becomes another. April 18th, 2002. Sandra Anderson is arrested and charged with planting false evidence. Sandra was basically astonished. She said, you have no idea who you're dealing with. How dare you do this? You know who I am. The world was going good, and then all of a sudden there's a disaster. There's a very much of a piece of me that did not want to believe it. It's a horrible moment for really everyone who's worked on this case. 20 years of work, um, you know, the, the family's emotions, justice for this woman, all of that is just evaporating, you know, in this forest in, in northern Michigan. Sandra came, you know, that day she came into the, to the arena right at, the, at the, the height of her game, and she left in handcuffs. Accusations abound, but the proof is slim. It's up to the FBI to prove that the renowned crime solver is actually a fraud. Two years ago, Michigan Sandra Anderson and her acclaimed canine eagle found a small hand bone. It's now part of a federal investigation. A state police investigator saw Sandra Anderson plant a human bone at a crime now scene. she's charged with planting human remains during searches for missing people in Michigan and Ohio. I can remember the day that I got the phone call telling me that Sandy Anderson had been arrested. I had been under... Uh, so much stress for four months and taking so much heat and it was just a vindication the challenge now to prove she did it Sandra Anderson's resume claims that she has worked thousands of cases all over the world there's a good probability that she planted evidence at other crime scenes this is going to be a big case with lots of tentacles running out Marthaler has his work cut out for him we would need physical evidence. So the first thing we did was search Sandy's house. I've been on many search warrants in many bad parts of cities. Nothing compared to the disarray that we saw at the home of Sandra Anderson. I remember one of the lab techs coming out, gasping for breath, saying, it's bad. She had seven dogs in such poor condition that the Humane Society had to come in and ultimately put down two of those dogs. We had found uh, various pieces of evidence, um, bones, human bones. Bones in a drawer or bones buried under clothing. Where'd she get these bones? That's the question that I've been asked over and over and over again. Where did they come from? Cadaver dog handlers have access to, to training materials through various sources. It may be a mortician, maybe a, a medical examiner. I guess she had a very good network. It's now up to the FBI lab to make sense of the evidence. There were several thousand bones. Bone fragments act like a jigsaw puzzle. If we could find bone fragments at Sandra Anderson's house that physically matched up to bone fragments found at the scene, that, that would be overwhelming evidence. But Anderson isn't going down without a fight. She's got a lot of friends in law enforcement, and she can count on them for support. The day after her arrest, out on bail, she contacts detectives from an old case. But they're suspicious and decide to tape the conversation. The last two days, I went up by the goodness of my heart to do a search. And because things aren't matching up, they're pulling me from the case because they think that I, I, I'll start crying if I even say it. They think I actually planted evidence. 
I think she was at that time panicking. I'm not going to deal with this. I have a 20 year impeccable career. While suspicion grows, Anderson supporters rally, including families of the victims she and Eagle tried to find. I'd have her back in a heartbeat. All this controversy came up and she hasn't come back, and that's the only reason I feel betrayed. Like many, they continue to believe in Anderson because she represents hope, even if she did plant the bone. These were people who said that she was being framed um, by either law enforcement or other handlers who were just jealous of her success. Sandy had a lot of supporters in the cadaver dog community that, that, that stuck with her because they believed that the law enforcement had it out for Sandy. Marthaler widens his investigation to all law enforcement around the country that if they used her, please notify us. I received 47 replies. 47 agencies now finally stepped forward to compare notes. The big thing that the FBI wanted to find out is whether there's anybody in jail based on evidence that Sandra Anderson found. There may be evidence now inadmissible, there may be verdicts that could be overturned. Dave Marthaler needs to know just how much damage did Anderson do? Day by day, the evidence against Sandra Anderson mounts. The true unsung heroes of this whole thing are the lab technicians. This was one of the largest cases like it that they've ever worked on. They were able to take bones that Sandra Anderson found at Proud Lake Recreation Area and match those based on color and texture and the wearing of the bone to bones found in Sandra Anderson's house. They were able to match bone fragments from Sandra Anderson's friends in Virginia to bone fragments found in Panama. And these three fragments fit together perfectly like a jigsaw puzzle. A small bone fragment found in Sandra Anderson's basement physically matched bones that were found at StressCon, that industrial site in Bay City. A small bone fragment found in Sandra Anderson's basement physically matched bones that were found at StressCon, that industrial site in Bay City. It gets better. In her pocket of the pants that she was wearing when she was arrested, were very unique blood-stained fibers that were the same as fibers found on evidence that was collected and the same identical fibers were found in her residence as for the blood-stained saw found in azizul islam's basement the fbi finally finds out whose blood was on the blade it belongs to Anderson herself. And what about the mystery of the 11th toe? One of the people that we spoke to told us that Sandra Anderson had a friend in Louisiana. And KTBS 3 News has learned an investigation into where those remains came from has led to the home of Captain Kerry Foster, head of the fire department search and rescue team. The FBI agents opened a freezer in the garage, found human arms, legs, and a foot with a big toe missing off the foot. It was a perfect match. In November 2003, Eagle dies of heart disease. Three months later, with her trial approaching, Anderson still denies the charges. It wasn't until the forensics was able to be put in front of her, DNA results, hair analysis, and all the other lab work did she finally realize that the case was rock solid, airtight, and she ultimately confessed to having planted evidence at crime scenes. On March 10, 2004, five days before her trial, she negotiates a plea bargain. She admits to falsifying a material fact, obstructing justice, 
and making false representations and statements. Sandy Anderson was served 21 months in a federal prison for planting evidence at crime scenes. But at her sentencing, she made a request to U.S. District Judge Patrick Duggan that her imprisonment be postponed until November 15th. She told the judge she needed to take care of her mother, who was to undergo cancer surgery this week. But it appears Anderson was lying. The mother did not need Sandra's help. And in fact, according to court documents, um, the mother tells the judge um, that her daughter is a pathological liar. She was lying from the beginning, and she lied right at the end. Ultimately, Anderson is sentenced to less than two years in prison and fined $14,500. As long as she alerts authorities during probation, she'll be entitled to work crime scenes once she's free. And that day is quickly approaching. Peter Kupaza is not as lucky. The case against him took stock in Anderson's claim that she found blood in his apartment. That testimony helped put him in prison for life. Despite that, he's lost his appeal for a new trial. Azizul Islam also appealed, based on the false evidence Anderson planted in his basement. He lost as well. Yes. Whoa. Beautiful. Oh, my God. Wow. What is this? Wow, that's about a foot. As word spreads of Anderson's crimes, how many other cases might now end up back in court? More. So we got three or four, four or five? It looks like skull, maybe. Skull, maybe. How many maybe, more maybe. of her astounding discoveries will turn out to be false evidence? There it is again. Wow. Mm -hmm. Five hits in this room. In some cases, you know, her evidence may have sent innocent people to jail, and in, in other cases may overturn um, the convictions of people that, who the police feel are guilty. Eagle touch. Ah. It's in here, obviously. There was a huge potential there that she put innocent people away. Here, go under his paw. Now, go. The last thing you ever want to do in any kind of criminal investigation is potentially arrest an innocent person and get them convicted and incarcerated. The sanctity of a crime scene is very, very important somebody's life or the someone's liberty may be hanging in the balance based on what we find so whenever there's a breach we take it very seriously well why did sandy do this i'm befuddled i can't come up with with anything logical sandy anderson's motivation was uh, strictly attention media attention she savored the attention she was getting from not only the media but from law enforcement when we went into her house on the search warrant, she had a lot of uh, front page articles from various newspapers on her wall. I think it was uh, some sort of high for her. She even says herself to the court, I lost track of why I was offering my services. It was a need to have people think that she was the best in the world. She was sweeping in, able to solve these cases, able to put, give closure to families. The true victims in this whole episode are the families, cases all over the country with similar stories where the families had their hopes up. We're telling it, we're going to bring closure to you. We're going to bring your daughter home to you. And then we have to call and tell them that we've all been taken, taken by Sandra Anderson.